Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Canis Albinas. Makalua. The main team. Mega Bears fan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Polycast episode 351, also known as Hopefully We Didn't Screw It Up This Time As Bad As We Did Last Time. Today. What did we screw it this hmm? time? What did we screw up last time? I it was mostly it. me because I haven't actually released episode 350 yet because I've been, you know, not doing well, uh, but it'll be out later today, the recording day, which is December 14th. But anyway, this is Canis Albinus, and we're joined with our full crew of Makalua. With my full cup of coffee. The me and team. Hello, hello, hello. And Mega Bears fan. Coffee is evil. I do chocolate milk. Yum. Although oh, I, I'm trying to lose weight, not gain weight. But coffee is evil, huh? Not evil? Did you just declare Warren Mackey? <laughs> I don't know. I think we may have to denounce him for that. Co- like, coffee- I see the potential of putting, cho- putting your chocolate milk in the coffee because then you have a mocha. Coffee is evil because it encourage or it enables employers to think it's acceptable to wake us up at seven in the morning. That's not the coffee's fault. Eh. I darn it. <laughs> <laughs> that eh sounded like Mad Gen for a moment there. <laughs> but I don't think he would denounce coffee, so No. Okay. I don't really drink coffee anymore either. Okay, so today we're gonna do something a little bit different. Uh, this show is pro- is not really aimed at our regular listeners, so if you're a regular listener who is a very strong player of this game, it will probably not be very interesting to you, but I have received at least three different messages from people, uh, specifically from, let's see if I can find their names, Zach Smith is one who sent me a message on Twitter, and then a couple of people who sent emails that I can't get to the email right now because I'm too... Uh, Oh, bo- bo- overlugged with uh, Windows to get to it, but basically the idea was, hey, can you do like a primer show primer. based on all the stuff that those of us who play on consoles who have never even heard of Civ before might actually be able to understand what you guys are talking about on the forums? And I thought, hmm, that's a good idea, and since this is the last show before the end of the season and the end of the year, we might as well do that. So... We have some general ideas on what to talk about, so let's let whoever wants to start, start. Well, before we go, I I just want to say that it's awesome that people who, I guess, have not even played the game yet are finding the show and, uh, you know, giving us feedback and doing topic requests. That's uh, awesome. So I I hope uh, all these people who sent you messages become regular listeners. I do as well. You're all welcome here, even if you don't like us. Almost especially if you don't like us, because if you're still listening to us and you don't like us, we must be doing something right. Yeah. So the most basic things, uh, we will avoid the the most obvious click this button to do this, because hopefully if you're smart enough to have found our podcast, since it is not exactly the most the most uh, easily findable thing, that you are at least competent enough to, to know how to click a button. And besides, if this is intended for the console players, none of us, I think, is actually playing the game on consoles. We're all PC players, so we don't even know what buttons you press on the console controllers to do things. So The buttons aren't that hard. I've played it on the Switch, and it's pretty easy to figure out as long as you recognize that you have to use the arrow keys sometimes, or the arrow buttons. Because otherwise it'll just do the first thing on the list, and that sometimes doesn't go well. But... All right, most basic thing in Civ, the thing you want to do is win the game. And the way you win the game <laughs> is by killing everybody else, almost exclusively. Uh, other ways you can win, you can build a spaceship and go to Alpha Centauri, although that is a more difficult thing to do if you are in a game full of particularly aggressive AIs, which is usually all of them on a higher level difficulty. You can also win by religious victory, although that is a little bit more difficult and a little more nuanced as to how you move your units around and produce your faith. 
It's also the only victory that you can explicitly get locked out of completing by relatively early in the game. Because if you do not found a religion, you are ineligible for the religious victory. Even if you conquer someone else's holy city, you still can't win a religious victory using their religion. So if you didn't found it, don't even worry about trying to get that victory. It's also, not possible. Congo cannot ever found a religion, so they don't get to participate in that victory at all. And Correct. you have to watch out for the AI spreading his religion to you and everybody else and trying to win it themselves. Because we've even had our multiplayer turn cast games ended because an AI did religious victory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, 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 it's and it's one of those funny to games. watch Dan lose that way. <laughs> <laughs> it happened and, once, uh, and then he turned it off forever. Yeah. <laughs> And the religious victory is something that's that, especially if you don't didn't found a religion and you're not playing religiously at all, it is very easy for another player or an AI to just slip that victory in under the radar without like you even really noticing it's happening. Because the game doesn't give you much in the way of notifications that uh, a player is is getting close to that victory. They tell you in other sieves of captured capitals. But with the uh, the religious victory, you kind of just have to keep checking up on that yourself. If you see another sieve that's getting like two, three, four, depending on how many sieves are in the game, uh, sieves converted, you definitely need to start doing something about it. Either you have to conquer them or you need to start aggressively spreading a different religion in order to hold them off long enough for you to get to your own victory. One thing I would broadly advocate, and this is for Forex in general, but especially for Civ because it has multiple is to keep your eye on victory conditions throughout the game because ultimately that is the uh, the win condition uh, literally speaking yeah so that that's what that's what you meet to end the game and you will if you go to the religion screen you will see uh, how many ais or how many of your opponents have been converted to a particular religion and who is leading as a result of that and that it, checking that can be the difference between winning and losing because it can inform your planning, but that will also tell you about the other victory conditions if you switch to those tabs. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you do want to know if somebody's like leading really by a lot in science or uh, military or anything else. Like it, it will, it could affect who your next targets are if you're fighting, or just let you know how how you stack up against AI if you have to change your plan or not if you're going to lose uh, with your current track. And also, <clears throat> you've got the handy report up there that even splits it down to each religion and how close they are, or not each religion, each victory and how close they are. So you can see somebody creeping along, you know, quietly creeping along in the science section. You go, oh, oh, I, I've got to knock them down a little bit. Also, yeah, remember if you're fighting that. and they're up like 10 techs on you, you might want to kill them now rather than later <laughs> before they get too far. We'll talk about war in a little bit, I think. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, it's something yeah. you want to check constantly, no matter what your victory condition is, because it can inform your choices enough to make it worth checking a lot. And if you do have to take action against another civilization in the game, it is generally best to do that earlier rather than later, because this game has a lot of what's called snowballing, which means basically that people who are already ahead tend to get even further ahead and the civs who are already behind tend to fall even further behind. So if someone already has a tech lead on you, don't wait around to think you're going to tech up to catch up to them because you're probably not. You're going to have to just go for it, you know, overwhelm them with more stuff. And yeah, we'll get to more of that on uh, when we actually talk about warfare. Actually, snowballing is not a bad place to start if for uh, a Forex primer in the first place. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, what are the four X's again? Expand, Ex explore, exploit, expand, exploit, 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 exterminate, and exterminate. exterminate. So exterminate. that's something to keep in mind. The, the bigger you are, or the, the the stronger your position already is, the more capable you are of strengthening your position further. So in in four X's in general, you want to increase your power curve as quickly as possible. And sometimes that does mean doing things that might be un unintuitive to a beginner. Uh, for example, chopping is considered very strong in Civ 6. And while we don't need to go into the nuance of that, uh, the reason that's considered so strong is it's giving you a benefit immediately rather than delaying it into the future. And because you're getting that benefit immediately, even though the aggregate total value of that singular decision is smaller, it's pushing your setup ahead earlier and, in the game, and that's worth and more. And of course, uh, when he says chopping, uh, what he means is cutting down forests or, or jungles or harvesting Correct. resources. Yes, any of that would fall under that category. 
And it, it's very often the case that lump sum bonuses in the game are more valuable than uh, long, like overturn bonuses. It's not always true, and you can do math on it, but a lot of people just don't factor present value enough when it comes to the rate at which their civilization strengthens or the rate at which their empire and other forex strengthen. This is this, these types of games are sort of light economy simulators in that sense. You have to you have to think where your brain is or where your system wants to go mm-hmm. in order to get the best out of it. And sometimes that does require forward thinking because it is a strategy game. Yeah. But I would uh I would actually err on the side of taking immediate benefit in forex typically. Yes, getting stuff now is generally better than getting stuff later. You, yeah, you use the chop, you build a library in your campus, uh, whatever turn, and you're getting that science from it so many turns earlier. And then as you keep going, that snowballs into you having techs earlier and then being ahead of the uh, <clears throat> other AIs or other players. And then you have a stronger army and you're more likely to hit all of your victory, whatever victory condition you're going for. And uh, another thing I would like to mention is if you are someone who is coming from Civilization 5 and for oh, whatever yeah. reason you decided to jump to consoles and are going to Civilization 6, uh, Civ 6 is much more of a builder's game than Civ 5 was. Uh, Civ 5, the best strategies often were keeping just a few cities. Uh, what was it, like 4 or 5 and going down like the tradition tree and, and stuff the like that. The most common uh, was 4 city tradition. That that yeah. was the most common in the- but in, in Civ Six, um, a lot of those global penalties to like number of cities and population, uh, they're just all gone. And you can build pretty much as many cities as you care to build and want to manage in this game. So if there's a resource that you need, uh, go ahead and settle a city near it. And the more cities you have generally in this game, the more stuff you are getting, the more yields, the more resources. It's the more more places you have to build units. Uh, and to build infrastructure and to uh, build commercial hubs and stuff to get more trade routes. So generally, building more stuff in this game is better. Yeah, as much as we love to mock the AI sometimes for building a crap city down in the tundra, if that's where your only gaining more oil is in the later areas of the game, it's it's a perfectly good city. There were two other victory conditions we didn't mention earlier. There's the culture victory condition, which, to be very frank with everybody in the room... I still don't know how it works, and I've played this game for three years. It's not yeah. exactly very clear how the tourism system works, other than make lots of culture to not get beaten by culture victory, and make lots of tourism to win culture victory. And yeah, the this big is thing, probably the big a good time to mention external resources while playing. Uh, I mean, we are one of them, but we're certainly not the only one. Uh, and it's very helpful to have like the uh, wiki up as long as it's accurate. Or you know, Siphonatic forums or other sources like that uh, while playing, so you can check how these mechanics work because it isn't always clear in the game. It should be clear. That's one of my most common criticisms of the game. But since it isn't, definitely uh, take advantage of any resource you can get your hands on for learning how some of these mechanics work under the hood, or at least enough that you you can make informed decisions about them rather than guessing, okay, well, how do I win culture? I mean, I, I guess I broadly need to produce tourism uh, and prevent the other person from making culture, but you just don't get enough information from that in the game. And you can get a lot of detail on this if you read through forum threads on it, for example, or wherever else you prefer to find the information. Yeah, I, I would say that the basics of you know building theater squares and producing great artists and writers and musicians and then making great works to generate tourism, that's, I think, pretty self-explanatory. The real confusion with the culture victory is how exactly all the counterplay works, because it's, it's not entirely clear how culture defends you from tourism and like even how the tourism spreads and disseminates across the world, so... Uh, but the basic gist is building great works and wonders and getting tourism from them and overwhelming the other players with lots and lots of tourism. The final victory condition is brand new and only present in the Gathering Storm expansion. That is the diplomatic victory. And for a beginner, I would suggest that you avoid that condition until you are more uh, nuanced and understand the game better, because even those of us who have played the game for a long time have a lot of difficulty with this condition. So a lot of it comes down to predicting the AI too, yeah. which which you really need almost experience. By definition, for. you need experience. Yeah, to... you need lots of experience to be able to figure out what the AI is going to do, and even then, you don't and always get it right. 
<laughs> Frequently, you don't get it right because the AI just goes off on some strange tangent, and you're like, okay. Yeah, and a lot of the points that you get towards the diplomatic victory come from fulfilling the little emergency, like, quote-unquote, quests, I guess would be a, a good way to describe them. Little quests that you get to go liberate a city or something like that. And, uh, yeah, if you're a inexperienced player, like, resolving those can actually be quite challenging. So, so, you know, you do want to be careful about accepting those quests until you are more comfortable with the game and you know how to find another player's capital or a specific city and, you know, how to actually properly capture uh, such a specific target. Because otherwise you're just going to be giving, you know, failing the quest and giving the your opponent uh, advantages. Yeah, and even we underestimate that sometimes because if, if they're not close to you and you think, oh, well, I can just punch through to that, sometimes to their capital, you know, through some of their other territory, sometimes you can't because there's other mechanics we'll get into later that makes trying to hold cities a pain in the rear. Or it's just or getting across the map. Like, yeah. for example, if you have to go liberate a city-state and it's on another continent halfway across the map, uh, you know, there's a turn time limit before you have to complete this goal. And sometimes like half of that time is just taken up sailing your units across the ocean to, to just get to the place. Yes. Yeah. If they're not relatively close, you might want to just pass on that emergency. Also, uh, go ahead. There is, uh, I, I was just going to mention, there is also one more victory condition, which is the, uh, the timeout slash score victory, which is just that <laughs> the game ends after a certain number of turns and whoever has the most points, uh, wins the game and points generally come from the, your number of cities and population and the number of wonders that you've built. Score victory is generally considered the you won mostly, but if you didn't complete a victory condition other than that, it's not generally a goal that would one would consider a good one. Usually that's the default, oh, you didn't lose condition. Not yeah, really something to brag as about. As you increase difficulty, you will not be able to win it normally because somebody will win before the, you run out of turns. And but for lower difficulties, you can win that way. It's just it, it's ideal to try to win one of the other victory conditions for that. Next up, should we talk about unit movement? Because I, I would, yeah, I think that's good. I, I would also suggest maybe going through some of the uh, early game things like exploration and dealing with barbarians and stuff like that would also be a, a good place. To, but unit movement is good as well. Well, unit movement is more complicated in Civ Six than it is in most other uh, 4X games, specifically because for, uh, Civilization VI uses the terrain as a barrier to your transit. In most games, you move one tile, and you can move to the next tile if you have a fraction of a movement point. In Civ VI, you have to have a full movement point to move, anywhere which means if you only have if you move by a road which takes a, a fraction of a movement point and then try to move off, off off the road without a full movement point you will not be able to do it well, this, minor correction uh, you have to have as many movement points as it requires to enter the the terrain you're uh, yes. going on to so if, if it costs two or three movement points to enter that terrain because there's a hill and a forest on it you have to have two or three movement points left you can't just move on to it with just one point left which makes the it only, a little bit more difficult for people who aren't used to that kind of thing right the only exception being if your unit still has all of its movement you can always move on to an adjacent tile with one movement point you're not going to get into a situation where you're like stuck in between a bunch of uh hill forests and your unit only has two movement and it's literally impossible to move it out that will not happen crossing really rivers always drains your movement points yeah now in total you've got roads well not roads, roads bridges do reduce, right bridges across the river <coughs> crossing <laughs> rivers also not the greatest got, idea to cross a river to attack something. Yeah. They are, uh, like, roads in general are weaker than previous versions, but they do offset terrain. Yeah, so in that context, they can be quite valuable. The later in the game you get, the better the roads are. Until we, we start talking <laughs> railroads. <in> the <laughs> well, yeah, at least the roads automatically improve as you go through eras and stuff, but when you get to railroads, you're going to have to build those yourself. Yep. Oh, and roads in this game are, again, a little bit different from previous Civ games, and also most games with roads, in that you don't choose to place them normally, but rather they form as a result of trade routes, typically. 
I think you can build them with that uh, military, military engineer, engineer but, but that's pretty late on. Yeah, it, it's pretty late in the game, and it's it's needlessly expensive in production, so it's not a realistic option. It's and not so you're mostly going to be using trade routes to make roads. Yeah, yeah, every individual military engineer can only build, I think it's like two or three tiles of road, and then he spent, and yeah, it's just almost always not worth doing unless you have some yeah. really, really strong need for a road somewhere. You would use that in a situation where you need a road to your own harbor, as opposed to another city, because you need at least two to get to another city, and that's if the cities are very close to each other. Yeah, or maybe building a road uh, into like a choke point where a conflict is going on, and you need to rapidly like move units onto or out of the front line to reinforce and heal. And there's a bunch of like hills and forests in the way that are blocking your movement. Then you might want to build a few tiles of road in order to just get your units back and forth. Definitely true. And there's everybody's favorite tunnels through the mountains, even though that is somewhat later on, but it's still nice. Unless you're the Inca, and it's also only in Gathering Storm. Yeah, that's true. That is only Gathering Storm. Because we, we, we are kind of ignoring the fact that the expansions are kind of expensive on the consoles, so some people may not have bought them. But uh, uh, as people who have played the game, we highly recommend that you buy the expansions, because they make the game much better. And not like ten dollar DLC. Ooh, you got an extra weapon. Better like holy cap, holy cap, crap! This is a whole new game, way more exp- expansion based game. No, t- cha- not entirely changing the gameplay, but adding more good things to the gameplay and adding more things for you to do. Like diplomatic victory is only a gathering storm thing. We haven't had that before, which is why we're still kind of also kind of like, uh, how we do this again? <laughs> Yeah, we'll probably get into more of the expansion stuff in future episodes, since this one will probably be focused on the vanilla game. I don't, the, are the expansions even out yet on yes. consoles? Yes. They're out on the Switch as well. Okay. So, okay, so let's what? talk about Barbarians. Barbarians are that early, morn- early game scourge that even early advanced morning. players hate. <laughs> they, and they can be they very are. nasty in Civ Six, especially compared to previous uh, entries in the series. Yeah. And they they will they will very easily wreck your face if you are not prepared for them. Yeah, what they ha- are optional. You can turn them on and off. But if you're going to leave them on, that means some of your early build stuff should definitely be military units. I mean, I know we, you know, because having more cities is better and you want to get your settlers out sooner. But you've got to have at least two or three to handle those guys. And one of those guys' a job is going to be escorting your settlers so they don't get sniped by the barbarians. And me um, personally, let's put it this I, way: I, I, more cities is good, but if you don't do something about the barbarians, you're probably going to struggle to actually get more cities. And yeah, it doesn't yeah. hurt to have military units, also because your enemies might decide that your cities are also good for them. Yeah, yeah so, they might decide you look like a tasty target. It, yeah, I, I was military say is that, not something you want to ignore. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that uh, leaving barbarians on, even as a new player, is actually, I think, a very good idea because you do want to build military units early in the game regardless. And having the barbarians there to kind of poke and prod and push you towards building military units will teach and reinforce, you know, what are good strategies in general. Because you want to make sure that you can defend yourself not only from barbarians, but from aggressive civilizations like Montezuma and Alexander and, you know, Shaka. Yeah, Shaka, if you have the expansions. Uh, because if you have a tiny army, almost any civilization in the game, no matter how peaceful they, they might seem, will turn on you at the drop of a hat when they sense weakness and might start capturing your cities because you don't have any units to defend them. And if you don't have units to defend them, they probably will capture your cities eventually. Yeah. The way the barbs work, you they first they have a camp, and these camps spawn randomly in the world on game start, and every time one is destroyed, another one spawns somewhere else on the planet. And these unit these barbarian camps start out with a single scout unit. And when these units find a civilization, they'll get a little exclamation point above their head, which means, hey, we've noticed something. They'll go back to their camp and tell them, hey, guys, there's a civ over here. We should raid it. And then the camp will start producing units slowly or faster than it probably should to create a raiding party. And they will send the raiding party to the city and try to capture it. Yeah, if you don't have very many units of your own, it definitely does not feel like they're producing those units slowly. It 
yeah. feels pretty dang fast. Uh, so you definitely want to have your units built before that happens. And you will get a notification in the, the corner or side of the screen that will tell you when a barbarian scout has found one of your cities and you should be able to hopefully, I, I guess on the consoles, click on it or press on it and it should hopefully take you to where that's happening so you can see. Uh, and if you can actually catch that scout and kill it before it gets back to the barbarian outpost, then you Dang. will save yourself from having to fight a horde of barbarians coming out of that outpost. Also be warned, if there is a horse unit anywhere within five tiles of the camp, it will send horses after you. Yeah, if you see that resource tile, it's uh, it's, it's, it's bad news. <laughs> and uh, what those horses, while in the early game they'll only be half strength, once they've made enough of them, they will become full strength. And those full strength horse units are much stronger than just about anything you can produce without any tech. Which means you're in trouble if you let that happen. So don't let the barbs get away. Right, which uh, I think brings me to something that I recommend doing, and I don't know if the other players here will uh, agree with me when it comes to exploration, which is to keep your early units close to your city. So that first warrior that you're going to start with, when you're exploring with him, uh, you should generally t try to stay on open terrain so he can move as many spaces as possible and reveal as many tiles as possible. But I also recommend that you kind of like spiral him out in, you know, enlarging circles as you go so that he's always at the closest distance possible to getting back to your city in case barbarians or an aggressive uh, civilization do show up and you need to defend yourself. Don't just send your starting warrior out in a straight line, uh, you know, for 20, 30, 50 tiles and then suddenly a conflict breaks out and you have no units because your guy is halfway across the continent. I agree, but for different reasons. Um, if you move your warrior uh, one direction, it's almost impossible early on in Civ 6, and this is one of my criticisms of the barb system, to then block a scout from just making the barbs attack you. So it's not realistic uh, for new players or even total pros to prevent early game getting scouted you just can't produce enough units in time to do um, to interrupt the scouts. You, you can eventually have enough to interrupt it, but not in the first 10, 15 turns. But the reason you want to scout around your immediate surroundings is that you do want to know where to place your cities uh, and where you can place your cities. If you don't see the terrain, you, you don't see good sites. Uh, so that's one of your most crucial early decision points. You want to see them. And helping against the barbs is a, a nice bonus on top of that. To have something close by, you can at least clean up. Um, you, you do want to produce enough units. And the other nice thing, uh, or the other thing I should would suggest you do with early game units, is that once you have scouted your immediate surroundings and you've begun to scout the AIs and whatnot, you want to leave screens. And by screens, I mean cheap units don't cost maintenance, that see stuff. Because you can then see barb scouts incoming, and you can see AI attackers incoming long before they declare war. There have been quite a few... Uh, player deaths on a turn cast games where they got blindsided by the AI where this tiny investment would have completely prevented them dying to the AI or getting roughed up a lot uh, by a surprise attack because they would have seen the, the 5 to 10 to 15 units coming their way uh, like as, maybe as many as 10 turns earlier but certainly at least 5 plus <laughs> and given the time to produce units and move units to defend themselves it's, a, it's very useful for the cost to be fair that's happened to everybody yeah, I was gonna it's say, not happened to we... everybody. I've never died that way in Civ 6. <laughs> and when you're squished in with other AI or other human players on the map, sometimes you're not sure who the AI is going after. You see it, but you don't think it's coming after you. Uh, they're pretty predictable in their movements if you have something immediately between them and you. I've seen them declare on the screen units before. That's fine. Like They're not taking your city. They're taking your screen then. Oh no, yeah, you killed it... my scout. Right. If they kill a scout or a warrior, you know, big deal, assuming you have more, you know, behind it to uh, uh, take its place. Yeah. Now they're not moving like three units surrounding your first city already. Now you have time to produce or at least move units that will block them from actually putting your city under siege. Yeah. And another benefit of having a lot of screen units around the perimeter of your early civilization is that uh, barbarians literally cannot spawn in places where any uh, civilization has visibility on the map so if you have uh, a unit you know if you have your territory completely surrounded 
by units that are providing visibility, then the barbarians cannot spawn like right up next to your civilization. They would have to spawn out in the places where you and no one else can uh, see. see. Specifically, the game won't place a camp in view um, if it doesn't already yeah. exist. True. The, the barbarians can still wander into places where you have visibility, obviously, but they, their little camps will not spawn in places that any player can currently see. Of course, that doesn't mean that if you move your unit for any reason, a barbarian camp won't spawn there the next turn. Uh, I've had that happen. <laughs> the very next turn, boom! Yeah, every time, I swear. Well, at least it won't be hard to find it. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> Any other tips or tricks for dealing with barbarians or for early exploration with your, uh, or just generally moving your units around? City placement? Yeah, do we want to do city placement or maybe early build orders? Do we want to talk about build orders? Let's do city what placement you first. You can build? I mean, right. the, the broad idea for build orders early in the game is you want to expand as much as possible uh, within your constraints. So there'll be things that interrupt your expansion, such as barbarians or hostile players or just insufficient amounts of land. Um, Or the land is really terrible before you get technologies. So your your broad goal is to expand as much as possible, but that as much as possible is contingent on your uh, your scenario. And you probably do want at least one of the early cities to be a science city so you can get all those technologies. Because if you sit there and just spam out and you're... Even though your capital has a, produces an okay amount of science to start with, you're going to start falling behind if you don't start raising that. You know. Although there are different play styles. I usually don't give a crap if I start falling behind a little bit if I'm doing military stuff. Well, but it's the expansion that really makes a difference. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you can win on the highest difficulties that way still. It would probably be hard against elite human players, but for a beginner guide, you, you just want to get to the point where you're out expanding the AI and able to beat it. I don't want what I want to prevent is having somebody like invest heavily in science early and get killed. No, uh, no, that's no. a very common beginner mistake <laughs> in any Civ game. Yeah, th- yeah, that's like get. I'm thinking you like get three or four cities outside of your capital out, and then either you uh, and hopefully one of those places was a good science place if your capital wasn't, and then you get at least just one campus down. You don't have to go through all cities, but you need to get something going. Yeah, and we're, we're talking about like, you know, 50 to 100 turns into the game. You know, we're not trying to say, you know, Maki's yeah, not trying to say that you late, should have, but... yeah, like turn five, you, you yeah. need to be building a settler and, and looking for a place to build a, a city and a campus and all that stuff. It, this is, you know, tens of turns into the game that you start thinking about stuff like that. Uh, again, early in the game, you definitely want to be focusing on units just to defend yourself because barbarians and other players are so aggressive. Well, settlers are units, though, and as soon as you can get away with them, you should probably be making them. Oh, yeah, especially if there is just a really great place for you to put a city, and especially if there's other civilizations that are really close to you, because they will be competitive for those places, and they will put their cities in crappy locations that are not worth conquering, but in that block you from putting your own cities in the better place that's two or three tiles away. So, yeah, there's that. I'd say you want the cities anyway. Yeah, regardless, it's, it's, even though, even regardless of those considerations, because like what, what's driving your victory conditions, even military, but any of the victory conditions it's the yields you're getting from your cities. Uh, and if you do the math on the yields, having your getting more cities earlier, like settling more cities, you, you start to see pretty big spikes in production, science, everything. So you want to get those down. Uh, the only reason you're building military units is that if you don't, your ability to expand and improve your empire strength through growing cities and uh, putting new cities down slash conquering cities is impaired uh, to the point where you are better off building the military units than you are building the cities. But if you could build the cities, build the cities. Just don't lose your settler to barbarians or get yourself mm-hmm. conquered. Right, or put your city in a place where you just cannot defend it. Yes, yeah. that would be getting yourself conquered. As far as, <laughs> Probably. As far as, as, far as city placement goes... Rivers are good. Coasts are not so good. Although being within range of the coast so you can build a harbor is okay. Um, For a a beginner player, uh, the game does give you tips on where to put cities when you have the settler selected. Do do we think that those are worth doing for beginner players or should we recommend that beginner players just completely ignore them and pick your own? I, I would recommend they good. start immediately thinking about why a city is good versus not. The suggestions can be a little loopy and it, it, it can lead you astray a little bit in terms I would, of I would, what makes a good city. 
I would say at the I very would... least, look at the tiles that are highlighted green. Those are probably almost certainly oh, yeah, you want the fresh places water. where you want, yeah, you yeah, want, where you want to put your cities. But the, the game will highlight like specific tiles uh, like within a certain distance of your settler. And it's not really the best at, at picking good spots. So you, you might want to ignore those and, you know, look at the actual yields and resources and, uh, and terrain and pick a spot yourself. Because you'll still have that green highlight on a river that's out in the middle of the plains of the tundra just because it's fresh water. But if you're up that high or into that, there might not be any good food resources and that city might be stunted the entire game. You would rather come back in closer to a grasslands area where that city can grow a lot, especially if there's food resources or if you're, you know, later on, if you're looking for some of the strategic resources, like you're, you're a little bit, there's some iron just a little bit outside your borders. And even if that's not a freshwater city, you might want to get up there and get that iron. Right. But your first like two or three cities, you should definitely be looking at making sure that there's a lot of food, decent production, and mm -hmm. at least a few resources within that that two or three tile radius around yeah, this, where you're going to especially gonna... luxuries to keep the city happy. Cause that's going to, as the city gets bigger, you're going to need that. Right. Uh, putting cities on top of hills is generally a good idea. It provides a defensive bonus. And usually uh, if it's a plains hill, we'll give the underlying city tile an extra production uh, for the entire game that you don't even have to work that tile. So if you can put a city on a plains hill, uh, especially adjacent to uh, a river or lake that is generally the best spot for a city assuming that the tiles around it are also you know decent also uh don't be afraid to settle on top of uh luxury and strategic resources yeah you still get them. Uh, in yeah in previous games they would disappear if you put a city on top of them and uh i think that uh, I, I don't know about the other players here, but for me, that kind of taught and reinforced, you know, bad behaviors for me, because now even in Civ 6, I'm I often forget that I can put cities on top of luxuries. And I don't even though that would give me better yield, uh, because you if you put a city on top of a luxury, you immediately get the benefits of that luxury. And Damn. your city also automatically gets some of the yield from that luxury. So you don't even have to work the tile, you don't have to use a builder to improve it, you immediately get the benefits and without having to, you know, work the tile with your population. And that's always a good thing. Getting more yields sooner is better than getting yields later. Well, it's not necessarily a bad thing to do if the it's not a bad behavior if it was a behavior that was good before the new game. It's yeah, just, it's just hard to now. break old habits sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm an old dog. Sometimes it's hard for these games to teach me new tricks. I'm a slightly less old dog, but I still don't know any tricks. <laughs> I'm I just can't. thinking it's funny to say that the barbs are the most brutal in Civ Six. <laughs> I don't know if they're the most brutal. But well, the most they annoying. can't take over cities anymore, but on the pain in the ass scale, they're pretty high. I, I was really annoying. I'm, I'm just remembering games where you could straight up die to them very easily in Civ. In yeah, Civ I, I was. Really, I, would, I was mostly I would, talking about as compared to Civ Five. I feel like the barbs yeah. in Civ Six are a lot. Uh, more difficult to deal with and a lot more threatening. But yes, you're right. In Civ 3, they could literally just walk into your city and capture it and burn it to the ground. Yeah, Civ 4, too. The Vitagarian event, you lose! Even without that, though, like on high difficulties, they would come for you early, and they were existential threats. They weren't just going to set you back. Like, you could literally just lose the game on the spot to them if you are not... Uh, I think on the right? I think on the highest difficulties in Civ Six they can capture and raise your cities, uh, but I think you have to be on like the top one or two difficulty levels. I, I've never happen, had it which... happen on Deity. I mean, I, I don't let them just wail on my cities for free to see what happens either, though. Right, but uh, like, like I'm saying, I think I think the rules actually do allow them to do that at the higher difficulty because the the barbarians' behaviors will change based on the difficulty level you select, so they will oh. get more aggressive. And they will do more they things. That. Yeah, I, I think on um, uh, what's the difficulty level right below deity? Is it emperor immortal? Immortal. I, I think it's starting at immortal. The barbarians are allowed to capture cities. I yeah, think I've it's on it's before. on the wiki. I think it was on the wiki. I don't know. Maybe I should double check. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought they always could. It was just a threat on the higher difficulties, but eh, it might not be right. I don't know. So we should talk about districts. Yeah, I think that's a good place to go after talking about city locations always build the districts that are the best for you um the way you decide that is 
Usually food, or usually the gold district is good because it gives you trade routes and it gives you money. Science, you need science. at least one of because you want more science. Um, I would prioritize campuses over money in at least since like early vanilla. Yeah, the money is good to support an army and stuff, but if you don't have a you don't have the technology to make a decently advanced army, you're still going to get raffle stomped. Even if you, you could have like a dozen units of a lower tech, but somebody comes through with half as many or less in a higher tech, and you can just get rolled right over. You know. I guess with I some have said in no particular order. Yeah. For example, if you invested in a camp in a, what's it in an encampment and have a great general boosting your army and uh, some unit experience, uh, possibly even cores and armies later in the game, that's less true and you can start actually killing stuff from more advanced eras without losing units. Uh, pretty routinely. So there's it, it's tough to say in a vacuum which district is the best. Because science is useful, culture is useful, gold is useful, better military units are useful, and you will get at least one of these things from most of the regular districts. So unless we're talking about something more niche, like, uh, what is it? Aqueducts or something, or entertainment. A lot of the standard districts are pretty good in the right context. And they also scale awkwardly in cost, which means that, like, it, it costs more to build a district you already have a lot of rather than one that you haven't built yet. Uh, so now not only does that fifth campus need to be better than your uh, alternative choices, but it needs to be better by more uh, than the cost as well uh, to justify it at that stage. So depending mm-hmm. on what you're trying to do, it may or may not be worth building anymore. Uh, this so is how it's the not game so is easy to, to choose what the best district is. Uh, I, I would say... Let but your strategy short and long term guide your district choices to some degree. But keep in mind that uh, some things you need right now will get you there faster, even if it seems off path. Like it, some science will still help you get culture more quickly. And example. in general, you don't want to fall too far behind in any category. So it, it is a good idea to uh, to build a diverse set of districts so that you are getting a little bit of everything. You know, you don't want to like completely neglect building theater squares because uh, it might not seem like it immediately, but getting culture is pretty dang important. That's how you get civics. Yeah, and a lot of useful policy cards too. Mm-hmm. And that's also the, the the tree that gives you, say, cores and armies. So even if you're a military person, it's pretty useful to be producing culture. Enough that you would probably do want to invest in those. You, you can get by not doing it, but it makes it harder than if you just make a couple. I mean, yeah, at least having like one or two, you know, put one down in one of your early cities, you know, when you're able to. You don't necessarily have to rush for it. I'm not saying you have to build one in every single city, but, you know, if you've got four or five cities, you probably should have at least one copy of every, you know, district. Another nice, uh, another important consideration here is the value of the district uh, based on adjacency bonuses. So the terrain itself will dictate how strong a a district is in a given place. And you might prefer something uh, that's significantly stronger, especially if like a doubling district policy card already. Uh, you might prefer to, to place a district that would otherwise not be your top choice, depending on that. Just because the modifiers are going to be so good. Like, yeah, say your or, or third you're city. allocating where you're putting districts based on this as well. Uh, yeah, like, like you've got a city this. that you made that was close to either a lot of rainforest or a lot of mountains, which is both good for campus adjacency. So you want to, you might prioritize getting the campus there before you even did like an encampment or the gold place, depending, you know, depending on if it was forward towards an AI, you might want the encampment, but and then uh, it's easier to place like the market district type of thing. I'm calling it that. It's a different name, but because there's a lot of adjacency on rivers and things. But then, commercial like, hub, then yes. <clears throat> yeah, commercial hub. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know names today. Harbors are good for money too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't want to be sure. directly on the coast, so you can't get attacked by ships so easily. But having being just one tile off and. This this is one of those things that comes from the earlier games. It feels so counterintuitive to not be on the coast, but one tile off it's actually better because you can still place the harbor, <laughs> and yet they can't overrun you with boats. This is well, the not, first not until game. later in the games when they have battleships and stuff like that that can bombard mm. your 
city real quickly. But they still have to land. <laughs> still an advantage to though. It yeah, still reduces true. the number of ships that can whale on your city, even in the late game. Because if you're on the coast and you have three range ships, they can stack up like six plus ships and have all of them shoot your city. Right. <laughs> right. Whereas if you're inland by a little bit more than that, it, you're, you're probably only getting shot by three battleships. That still sucks, but <laughs> it's a lot less than it was if you could less. literally put it on the coast and they could just run up an ironclad to take your city. Oh, yeah, that's true as well. They, they can't just take your city with a melee ship. They'll have to, at minimum, land a unit to take the city, even oh, if wow. they do blow it to pieces. Uh, so th- there are some advantages, no matter what, to not being on the coast, but still having access to naval stuff. Yeah. Each of your cities, as you place them and build them, you, you, you're sort of trying having to think in the back of your head what districts are going to be good in this city, because you can't build every district in every city. You have to specialize them a little bit. And it's quite weird. a bit. The number of districts that you can build is locked by the population of the city. So you have to reach certain population thresholds before you're allowed to build another district. Like the the second district you can't build until you have, what is it, four population? So you also need to make sure that your city can grow to those sizes if you want to build all of those districts. Because otherwise you will just not be allowed to. Um, do we actually think we want to go through all the districts and like what they do and how to get adjacency bonuses, or is that like too much minutia? I think and- I think, we've I, been I think that, that would be better to look up on the wiki as someone learning is playing rather than trying to listen to us now and hold all that memory. Yeah, all the memory. Yeah. Where this is a, a over the a brief explanation as opposed to a detailed. So uh, the most yeah. important thing about districts is never build a neighborhood. Wait, hold up, hold up. Right in the game, that's actually great for getting more housing when you don't have a lot of space. And the Zulu actually have, uh, I think it's the Zulu, have a special district that they get really early that is a Hong neighborhood. Thank it's, you. Uh, Hong Hong Hong. Not too that's common great. to see good players build neighborhoods. The reason you don't build neighborhoods is because uh, the AI recruits partisans, which are bad. Oh. That's one of several reasons. <laughs> Yes, also, that one or two per city I might build as Congo is really going to be a, p- a bad thing later. I just yeah. Also, well, that was Congo a is joke. a little bit different because they get them earlier. But there's there's a couple things going against neighborhoods, and this goes into our strategy and what kind of game we're trying to win too. So I guess it's worth mentioning. So as cities grow, it becomes increasingly expensive food wise to grow further. So even if you have neighborhoods. It's going to take you ages to grow from like pop 19 to 20, for example. And what is the marginal value of that 20th pop? What is it doing in that city uh, that makes it worth the growth? Uh, Because in Civ 6, you don't have the same kind of value from specialists as you would from earlier games. Yeah, if specialists specialists could generate great people points, that might change that dynamic. In previous games, yes, but now no. And so what's your 20th best tile in the city? It's probably not that good. Uh, not too many cities can slash should have guaranteed so like 15 plus good tiles. Uh, so <laughs> you're spending a lot to grow onto something very marginal as opposed to just producing something else or, or in, including just skipping the neighborhood in the first place and getting more value out of it. I was mostly making a joke, but okay, that's all true. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say never do this, but it, it's true that you don't see a lot of neighborhoods out of the really fast space win games or people who just conquer the world quickly. I, I don't know about culture. I, I don't really do culture a whole lot, but it just like in, in effective play, they don't show up a lot. And it's not just because of partisans, although yes, the extra annoyance factor does not make them more attractive to me, despite their <laughs> inefficiencies. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of the times where I've ended up playing them, uh, building them is I didn't, early, I'd made bad, worse decisions earlier about what to build and I just needed a little bit of extra elbow room. Like maybe I only need one or two of that capacity for a neighborhood. Or you have something like it's where you're Australia and they have that bonus to things because of uh, the beauty on the tile. And it's like, oh, I can have a plus eight housing tile, just this one tile. I mean, great. My housing problems are solved for the rest of the game. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to say never do it. Yeah, there's that, always exceptions depending on the, the map circumstances and the specific civilization you've chosen. So everything we're talking about is just general yeah. guidelines. Like, all of it is subject to change depending on the conditions of your game. Yeah, and somebody here has an entire website breaking down each civ for you. 
Well, not all of them. Well, a lot of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, if, yes, if, if you are looking for guides for specific civs, I have written a series of, of strategy guides at my personal blog at www.megabearsfan.net. Uh, I hope you check them out and that they prove helpful to you. I've got something like, I think, 20 guides written currently. So thank you, Mackie, for the <laughs> shameless self-promotion. <laughs> well, you know, considering it is very helpful, you know, we, we, we've even gone through, I mean, even before you were a co-host, we, we, we had you on sometimes, but sometimes we just go through the articles on your blog when we were still doing so five stuff. So, you know. And there are lots of other guides too. There's there's not just mine. Uh, I know there's a user on Steam named uh, Zigzag Zigal. I'm not sure how exactly to pronounce that. Uh, that user produces some pretty detailed do- guides that talk about all of the uniques of the civilization and how to use each of them, and then you know some general tips and some more specific tips for each victory type and all that stuff. Uh, so you know there's there's plenty of good guides around for you to find uh, if you look for them. Definitely useful. All right, now for the big one: war and fighting. Where to start? <laughs> uh, yeah, where do we start? Do we I, like maybe the basics of the combat rules? Uh, maybe we should start with the- with the warning that if you be careful how you declare war and when and on who, because the civs do have a problem with you if you start killing people. They will get and, uh, angry. And the specific mechanics for that change depending on whether or not you have the expansion packs. Do we want to talk about Warmonger in the vanilla game, or do we want to talk about Grievances? Should we save Grievances for a later episode when we talk more specifically about the expansion? I think we should talk about uh, the Grievance system. AI just does so little with it. Like, it's worth considering because it will have an impact on your ability to, like, say, make alliances and get yields that way. But coordinated attacks from the AI as a response to player aggression are flimsy at best, even on the highest difficulties. It's it's yeah, usually it, not a significant threat. So, if you're going to be playing a military victory where you're going to be conquering everybody anyway, you really don't need to worry at all about what the other AIs think of you because you're going to kill them all anyway. But if you're playing a more peaceful strategy, uh, you know, or you're just learning the game and you don't want the AIs constantly attacking you, you definitely want to consider... Uh, the warmonger or grievance system when you're declaring war or reacting to a war. Yeah, yeah, the AI has some convoluted logic when it comes to how it evaluates wars. But the, mm-hmm. I guess the basic gist of it is the that whenever you declare war on another civilization, or you capture cities, or you capture their capital, or you wipe another civilization off the face of the planet, you're going to generate either warmonger points if you're in vanilla, or you're going to generate grievances if you're in... uh, Were grievances added in Gathering Storm, or was it Rise and Fall? I want to say Gathering Storm. Gathering Storm, I think. Uh, But they they function similarly, which is that basically it's going to act as a diplomatic modifier that will basically make every other civilization in the game hate you. And in the course of Warmonger score in vanilla, that lasts for pretty much the entire rest of the game. And if you if you do that enough and get enough Warmonger score, you will never be able to recover from that diplomatically. So you definitely want to be careful early in the game about who you're picking fights with and how you're resolving those conflicts. I believe it did decay. It was just not fast enough where if you accrued a ton of it, it would be gone in any meaningful amount of time. Yeah, it, it decayed faster in the er- earlier in the game. So like if you declared wars in the ancient era, I think those that warmonger score would decay within like an era or two so that by like the medieval er- era, you're, you know, you're fine again. But the wars that you're declaring in like the Renaissance, like you're not getting rid of that warmonger score <laughs> ever for the rest of the game. Yeah, probably not. Not by the time a game would normally end anyway. And yeah, that will affect your ability to trade with the AIs because the less the AIs like you, the less they're willing to give you uh, in trade. It'll affect your ability to have friendships, to make alliances, to declare joint wars and get uh, help uh, against other civs, uh, which, you know, especially for a, a new player, like having the support of the other AIs in a conflict can really make or break a, a, a game when you're learning the game. So, you know, you definitely do want to uh, Man, try to have a picture. <laughs> and and uh, it's also AI is pretty bad. Well, at, at yeah. moving units and fighting. 
what, what my, from my experience is it's not necessarily the AI going in and fighting, but it's it's the AI just basically giving your target another target to worry about, especially if they're coming on a different front, uh, because it means that, you know, that other Civ has to possibly split its forces up between two different fronts, and that will make it easier for you on your front, even if your AI companion is just getting their butts kicked on the other front. It's called a yeah, meat shield. Now, there's one thing I want to say here, because so far we've made it sound like going to war is negative. These penalties are put in place because it is by far one of the most effective ways to expand your empire and secure a winning position with its com- with competitive with, with the alternative choices not even being close. And to the extent that these penalties really aren't much of a ter- deterrent in practice, if you can conquer like six to ten AI cities and you're just trying to win the game, that's what you're caring about, you should conquer those cities. Uh, generally, any value you've lost from the diplomacy or threat of other AIs is trivial compared to the value of just expanding your empire that way. That's true. And but if, if they if hate you, are, you, you just are. take their cities too. So I, yeah. you will eventually win if you keep doing it. But if you are and a you new will player, get stronger and stronger. As if you, you are a new player and you're just you you don't understand why none of the AIs will trade with you, uh, it probably <laughs> because of this. This is one way. Yes, uh, if you conquer nations, they don't like you, and that's fair. In e- even in PvP, like if somebody's conquering a lot of cities for different reasons, everyone else is going to get a little nervous because this does increase your strength so much that you become more of a threat to win. So even human players will take it seriously, albeit for different reasons than the AI. But that just goes to show how strong it is to do, uh, how valuable it is to do if you can do it. Which, again, is one of the reasons that we recommended building a lot of military units early in the game to deal with the barbarians. Because now when you start to get into war with the other civilizations, you'll kind of reap the rewards of having those units because you've already built them. So you don't need to spend production on them now. Uh, as you learn new technologies, you don't have to build new units from scratch. You can upgrade your existing units with gold, and war is a very good way usually to get gold because uh, you're pillaging tiles or plundering trade routes and stuff like that. Uh, science, too. Uh, yeah, and yeah, science. science. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, having that, uh, having a sizable army earlier in the game, even if it was just for dealing with barbs, will be beneficial to you in the middle parts of the game and later in the game when you are using that army either to defend yourself or to conquer another civilization. And all that experience they've gained, especially when you've got like archer units that you've promoted a few times and now they've got like multiple attacks per turn to help wear down like a city a lot faster. And they gain that from fighting bars, you know. I would recommend that you do make an effort to try to protect your well-promoted units uh, because losing a unit with like getting the first one or two promotions generally is, is pretty quick and easy. But when you've got a unit with three promotions or four promotions, if you lose that unit, oh man, that is nasty. It hurts. Yeah. And generally speaking, although it has improved a little bit since vanilla, most of the time when you're fighting an AI in a war, it's possible to avoid losing units like at all. And we've seen times so that's something we to totally keep in mind. think we're going to lose it. And then the AI just doesn't shoot that unit. And then you're like, what? Oh, it's getting a little bit better about that now. But I would say if you're losing units, it's worth thinking about some practice so that you don't lose units. Uh, because most of the time, it's possible to avoid uh, losing military when fighting the AI. Not yeah, always, you- but most of the time you can avoid it. And if you if you need more practice, you can also go into a, a hot seat game like against yourself and just build a bunch of units on both sides on like a tiny dual map or whatever. And just like, you know, practice things like uh, like sieging cities and zone of control so that you can see in a controlled environment how that stuff works, because understanding those rules is very important to uh, military success in Civilization Six. Yeah. Uh, do we want to talk about zone of control? <laughs> if you want to go for it basically if oh. you move next to an adjacent unit you have to attack it or stay where you are but some units ignore zone of control and some units by default don't uh, create zone of control for example. right archers uh, don't uh, typically exert zone of control and frequently the mounted line will not uh, be affected by zone of control and this combined with the 
you know, cost of moving onto tiles uh, in Civ Six really can slow down the the movement of your armies. If uh, if the opponent just puts like a few units uh, in your way, like it can really slow you down. Note that defensively, especially in high levels, this is crucial for protecting your cities. If you put units that are fortified near your city, the AI will struggle to move into range of the city, which means your archer and the city, and if you built them walls, will get free hits on the units as they attempt it. But also that they can't put your city under siege, which will uh, would otherwise prevent it from healing every turn. And they also just can't attack it with as many units until they deal with your units. They have to get your units out of the way, or they can only attack from like one or two spots against your city. So this is a very good defensive resource, zone of control, because you can force the AI to either attack you or um, to move very slowly and be ineffectual as it tries to approach something other than the unit that's defending. Uh, So, yeah, positioning for zone of control and then try not to get yourself surrounded by three or more units because uh, that allows relatively similarly strength units to focus you down and kill your units, which you want to avoid but it's possible to kill way more troops than you lose on the defensive against the AI if you're willing to rotate units and you have them positioned well. Okay. Well, it looks like we have reached the point where we need to consider um, wrapping up for this episode and possibly coming back for a later one. Is there anything critically important that we haven't said that beginners need to know? Uh, One thing that uh, I remember going back to uh, districts is uh, a very good tip uh, it's, I guess, kind of an intermediate to advanced tip, but you should probably get used to doing it earlier rather than sooner, is um, the cost of districts increase as the game goes on, as you uh, develop more technologies and build more districts. But if you place the district down on a tile, it locks in the cost of that district. And so it's a very common strategy for good players, even if you're not going to build the district right now, just to place it on the map early so that it locks in that cheaper cost before you research more texts or anything like that, and the cost of that district goes up. I'm going to step back from the weeds for a bit and just emphasize, because it's still true in Civ Six, and it just says it is in every 4X previously, you want to increase your empire's output as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And in the vast majority of cases, that should be guiding your decision-making throughout the game. That is your overarching uh, focus to being in an effective position in 4X in general and in Civ 6. So if you are uncertain of what to do in the moment, start thinking about what gets you there. I think this is all very good advice. All right, well, in that case, it's time for me to be more prepared than I currently am, apparently. Let's see if I can spell this right. Apparently not, because I forgot the space. Oh, I didn't assign anybody to do the the outro this time, did I? <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, let's see. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we'll say, how about you do it, Mega Bears fan? Awesome. Uh, what episode number was this again? <laughs> 351. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Thank you, Internet, for listening to Polycast episode 351. I have been your regular co-host, Mega Bears fan, along with Canis Albinus. Everybody have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a good New Year. Makalua. Also have a happy Sivmas playing. And the Mian team. Soon you too can have hundreds of horsemen running through enemy territory. As long as they're healthy horsemen, I don't care. Well, of course they are, because they're eating all the enemy crops as they pillage everything. Uh, well, that may not make them healthy, but... Too much green makes horses sick. Oh, well, it's not just green. (laughs) There are other colors, too. Yeah, they're getting smart eating all the books. Oh, dear. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Horses. That's not what I've had in mind, but it's funny. I was going to say, horses <laughs> eating paper may also not be a good idea. <laughs> oh, I forgot. It's not goat cavalry. It's okay. They can survive on the blood of our enemies. Uh, yeah, I think that would make a horse sick, actually. Uh, <laughs> that would make most things sick. Not, pigs, not everything, not but pigs. most things.
Pigs can eat the blood of their enemies. Nice. Unfortunately, I don't know how to make pig cavalry units. I don't think anybody does. Because that does sound pretty horrifying. Send that through enemy territory. Civilization 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6 sound clips. Copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright the polycast at thepolycast.net.